account, your GitHub ID, and even Twitter. So let me take a brief moment so that the participants can sign up on the portal. Once you have signed up on the portal, please put a yes so that I can take you through the various features of the portal. So I'll be waiting for your response. Please, please put a yes. And if you're facing any technical issues, please put that in the chat and our team will be happy to resolve the queries. All right, I've got one yes. I'm expecting more yeses. All right, I've got three yeses. So now I'm going to log in since I already have an account on the portal. So once you sign in, this is the, the you, you will be landing on the courses tab. So here you will have the opportunity to browse through various courses and example projects that you can take a look at. So since most of you will be interested in the genomics, I'm going to type genomics and you will be able to see the diverse range of topics from COVID-19 to Ebola virus that you can take a look at. And if you wish to gain your concepts in genomics straight first, then you can go to the courses. Before that, click on the tab that says welcome back with your email ID. Here is where you will be able to update your account. So how do you go about doing that? Click on the tab that says profile and here you'll be able to edit your bio. So here I've mentioned my educational background and my research interests and I've linked my LinkedIn account and my archive. So under the activity tab, the mentor and the community manager will be able to track your progress. Under the courses tab, you'll be able to view the present courses that you're taking and the projects will uh, show the if you have completed any projects uh, under any pro, uh, under any programs, and here it shows the programs that you have enrolled. So with that, now I'd like to pass on the stage to Dr. Raga to begin with today's webinar. Over to you, Dr. Raga. Thank you very much, Sri Gauri. And let me find ways to share my screen. Yeah, please confirm you can see my screen and also you can hear me clear. Yes, yes, sir. both are working fine. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So welcome to uh, uh, the orientation uh, webinar of uh, genomics data analysis. Wait a second, let me set it up. Yeah, today we will be having a, a, an introduction to what this program has to offer to us. And we will also uh, have um, a good introduction to different resources in Omics Logic platform and also the associated Hubbard BioInfo platform uh, with which what we can do uh, with genomic data analysis, what we can learn. And uh, we will quickly go through a couple of demonstration uh, that will help us to annotate, uh, let's say for example, um, very well-known cancer uh, driver gene, one of the very well-known cancer driver gene. Okay. Uh, so we already spoke about that. We will uh, start with what is genomics data how is it organized and how is it analyzed and how is it interpreted to be such a powerful resource in the hands of researchers like you, in the hands of clinicians and also in the hands of entrepreneurs that are reading the code of DNA to battle cancer, to fight infectious diseases, and even sometimes to an extent to solve crimes. So let's start by reviewing the fundamentals of genomics. Genomics is all about DNA, so let's review what is this DNA code? What do we already know about it? And what kind of answers can we find there? And how can we analyze huge sequences of nucleotides stored in the DNA? And how do we make sense of them? Right? Just pretend to be a book, just like a book, a DNA code is organized letters that form sentences and sentences could form paragraphs and paragraphs are organized into chapters. And knowing how to read this code can actually help us decipher the full story about who we are and we can look into our history. We can understand how we are connected to other living things that are uh, living around us. So DNA is short for deoxyribose nucleic acid. It is a long molecule composed of two chains of coil that uh, go around each other to form a double helix. This carries genetic instructions for development, for the function, growth, and reproduction of all known life, right? This, these uh, all known life forms include multi and single cellular organisms, 
as well as many bacteria and even some viruses. Yeah. So human genome, for example, has 3 billion base pairs in one, uh, yeah, in one chromosome. Okay, uh, so a DNA code contains directions or it contains recipes for life. Life is the condition, how can it be defined? It can be defined that it is a condition that distinguishes animals and plants uh, from inorganic matter that is, um, this condition could include the capacity for growth, it could include reproduction, it could include functional activity, it could also include continual change preceding death. So this instruction for life uh, include life of a single cell and an organism like us, humans, which contain over 37 trillion cells among us, right? Each cell contains the same DNA, which is stored tightly around the nuclear, in, inside the nucleus, right? When the cells divide, as they do when a new organism is formed or when a new cell has to be generated, we see how this DNA is organized. So we get a hint about this organization of uh, this DNA into chromatins and other forms. The nucleus is opened up and inside, we discover these tightly packed strings that can be visible under uh, low power microscope also. So it is, we already saw that it could be um, tightly packed into 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? One of the chromosomes come from my uh, from our mother and the others come from other come from our father. Right? The unique structures of these chromosomes will keep the DNA tightly wrapped around the spool like proteins called histones. Without such packaging, these DNA molecules would be too long to fit inside the cell. For example, if all of the DNA molecules inside a single human cell were to be unwound from their histones and placed end to end, they would stretch up to six feet. The largest chromosome, which is chromosome one, contains about 8,000 genes. And while for a, mm, to compare, the smallest chromosome, chromosome 21, contains only about 300 genes. And once the cell division is complete, the information on the cell function uh, stored inside the DNA helps the new cell know what to do to continue the function. It will work on for the rest of its life and preserve the DNA to pass it on to the next cell that it will form when it divides. And in the meantime, the DNA contains instruction for various functions a cell must perform to grow and maintain this life function itself. So therefore, the DNA code contains both actively needed recipes and all kinds of other instructions that need to be stored, but not necessarily used all the time. So together, all of the specific code in a chromosome can be termed as a genotype. Yeah, my an animation stopped working suddenly. So the product of this code and how it interacts with the environment is what we call as phenotype. A phenotype can describe a single cell, a tissue, an organ, or the whole organism. The phenotype of an organism might include height, size, activity, while the phenotype of a cell might include its specific function, uh, says, uh, size, and sometimes its morphology. So molecularly, uh, at the molecular level, the DNA is made up of nucleotides. A nucleotide's chemical composition, what suddenly happened? Uh, yes, sir. I guess you need to share your screen once more. Yeah. Yeah, can you see it? Yes, sir. It's busy. Okay. We were discussing about the molecular structure of the DNA. So DNA at its molecular level is made up of nucleotides. And uh, one nucleotide is actually made up of a sugar called deoxyribose and uh, nitrogen containing base and a phosphate group. The nucleotides are joined to one another in a chain by covalent bonds that form between the sugar molecule of one nucleotide and the phosphate of the next, resulting in alternating sugar phosphate back. Each strand of DNA molecule contains a sequence of bases that is complementary to the bases in the opposite strand. The pairing between these complementary bases gives rise to the characteristics double helix shape of the DNA. In this structure, A is bound to T and G is bound to C. 
So to understand how DNA works and to read its sequence, a special project was aimed at decoding DNA that was launched like uh, in 1990. This 13 year long project which, which was initiated in 1990 focused on determining the DNA sequence of the entire human genome. Scientists set out to determine the DNA sequence and the location of estimated 100,000 human gene, quote, estimated at the time of uh, this discovery. Okay? Many at the time believed that once we had such sequence, we would quickly be able to determine where all the genes were and the process of reading DNA sequences and piecing together laid the, this process of reading these DNA sequences and piecing together laid the foundation of what we now know as genomics. So, but simply reading the code and annotating it became much longer process than the human genome project itself. Today, there are several competing human gene databases with many thousands of differences among them. And although the number of protein coding genes had gradually converged, the number of other gene types had exploded. The latest count had found over 21,000 genes since the human genome um, project was complete. So uh, from the estimate of 100,000 at the beginning of the human genome project, now everybody agrees that there are around 21,000 genes in the uh, protein coding genes that are found in our uh, uh, human body. But something supposed to be noted that these protein coding genes form only one to two percentage of the entire genome. So much more information about how these protein coding genes are regulated and how, uh, how these protein coding genes are translated into proteins are encoded in the other 98 percentage of the uh, gene. So this DNA is stored inside the nucleus as organized into chromosome and specific regions, right? Some of the easiest regions to read and evaluate are called these protein coding genes that we just discussed. So the protein coding genes are nothing but the sequences that are used to produce proteins. And how are they produced? This is defined or this is described in the central dogma of molecular biology, which describes a two-step process, transcription and translation, by which the information in the gene flows into the protein via an RNA. Right? In each step of this transformation, we see how the DNA code is used. First, transcribing the source code into a working repository of RNA where some of this code is modified and then it is released to produce a protein. My animation is actually running slow. So this process is facilitated by several key proteins, one of which is called DNA polymerases that attaches itself to DNA as it unzips the double helix and replicates the DNA to form a single strand adding complementary bases and creating a second copy. This copied code can then be used in another cell, but it's important to make such replication go, uh, it is important to make sure that this process goes without any mistakes. So a lot of cells instrumentation are designed to prevent such mistakes while carrying out these processes. Right. Each gene is a recipe for specific protein. So it encodes instruction from this, uh, from which a protein can be made. Right? The proteins are actually product of amino acids, which are encoded by trinucleotide codons that are stored on the DNA. So a codon is actually a sequence of three nucleotides that corresponds to a specific amino acid or a stop signal, which will stop the production of this specific protein. Once the right place on the DNA is copied over, it is prepared by translating um, this into a, a, it is prepared for translation by forming a messenger RNA, which is exported from the nucleus into the cytosol, where this messenger RNA is actually translated into protein. Again, my, this is running soft. Okay, so in human cells alone, genes vary in size from few hundred DNA bases to more than 2 million bases. For example, the keratin associated protein gene like KRTAP is the smallest gene that we have characterized until now. It is only 447 nucleotides long. Whereas uh, CNTN AP2 gene, for example, has over 2 million nucleotides. The number of genes also vary between various organisms. For example, 
Influenza virus has only 11 genes, while the grape genome has over 30,000 genes. Genes are not just a simple organization of sequences of nucleotides. In fact, they have upstream and downstream regulatory sequences that controls the transcription of these genes. Inside the gene sequence itself, there are codons and there are introns that undergo splicing before a gene is translated into protein. The extraordinary length of some of these genes is enabled by the presence of introns, which as a substrate for, uh, which acts as a substrate for insertion and deletion of several transposable elements. This also provides a mechanism for the generation of diversity through alternative combinations of these exons, which is also known as splice forms. So the translation in the cell is done by the ribosome, which can read the mRNA sequence and assemble a protein that will fold into a functional structure. Then, uh, yeah. When we want to understand the function of a particular protein, we typically combine the information about its chromosome position, its coding sequences, its regulatory region, the structure of the protein, as well as the functional features of the protein through various experimental validation and through various bioinformatics comparative analysis approaches. So before going into uh, uh, how this uh, uh, DNA could be uh, analyze and how they could be understood. Uh, I want to stop here and ask if you have any queries or questions until now. If you don't have any questions, please uh, let me continue. And if you have questions, please put it in the chat box. I'm following the chat box. So we will address your questions as we go by. So that is a short introduction about the DNA, its organization, genes, and how they form basic uh, Fun fundamental element and functional element of any each and every cell. Now let's let's see or let's discuss how to analyze this DNA code and what are the information that we are going to extract from analyzing this DNA code, right? Uh, so the we recently crossed the seventy year mark since the discovery of structure and function of the DNA molecules, and it took something around fifty years from the time to sequence the first human gene. But soon after that point, the technology developed so much that the availability of the human genome just exploded rapidly. So by around 2015, 1000 Genome Project was, uh, uh, was launched and it brought actually significant number of whole genome sequences into the research community. And, and uh, <coughs> again, it went too fast. Yeah, we discussed this. So non-coding RNAs are also part of the uh, uh, part of the gene or uh, genome, not actually genome. So they serve specific function in regulating which part of or which uh, which gene are actually uh, uh, translated by how much. So now several important functions of the long and short non-coding RNAs are actually actively being uh, identified and actually being discussed, and they're uh, they're participation and their uh, uh, role in regulating these genes could actually serve as a purpose to understand several disease state of a cell or several altered state of a cell. So it collectively, the omics uh, uh, aims at characterization and quantification of the uh, different biological molecules. Uh, yes, we can use several available public uh, genomics database like NCBI and et cetera. Uh, are, are part of that. So to know more about how to use these databases for what kind of data and what kind of analysis, it, the program actually discusses a lot about that and how we can leverage the publicly available resources for our own research. So let's continue with that. We were discussing about the omics data in particular. So the omics data uh, aims at collective characterization and quantification of the biological molecules that translate into structure, function and dynamics of an organism. Right? The omics technologies are used to explore the roles, relationships, actions of various types of molecules that make up the cell of an organism. Many type of these omics data can be generated using next generation sequencing technology, which is also known as high throughput sequencing technology. 
the data can show detailed information about gen genomic variants, about um, epigenetic variants, and about uh, transcriptomics uh, um, uh, expression pattern of genes and isoform level also. So the suffix ohm actually refer, defines or refers to the various uh, or refer to various field of omics in molecular biology, and bioinformatics refers to a totality of all analysis of all of these different omics data types. For example, the word genome was actually first coined in Germany in the beginning of around 20th century. The word genomics refers to the totality of the genome or the studies of genomes. Genomics actually itself is an interdisciplinary field of biology focusing on the structure, function, evolution, mapping, and editing of genomes. The genome of an organism is a complete set of DNA as we discussed, and this includes all of its gene. In contrast to very well-known uh, branch of biology, genetics, which refers to the study of individual genes and their roles in inheritance, genomics aims at a collective characterization and quantification of an organism's genes and their relationships and influence on the uh, organisms. What happens to the introns after protein synthesis? So sometimes they are actually discarded, right? Only exons, which are um, uh, which form part of the mRNA sequences, are actually exported to the exported to the cytosol, where protein synthesis takes place. Introns do not cross the uh, uh, or several known introns, right? Ninety nine percent of the introns do not cross the uh, uh, boundary or um, uh, a nucleus, nuclear membrane as such. So what do we do by, what do we mean by studying genomics, right? As a result of a lot of genomics efforts, we can now detect differences which can be harmless or we can detect differences which can lead to serious issues when a gene is produced. The whole study of genomics is centered or focused on identifying specific differences, what we term as variants or mutation or polymorphism, which we will discuss in further slides in the available DNA sequence, right? Um, these can actually occur as a result of copying the DNA source too many times or as a result of various stresses that can interfere with the uh, regulatory mechanisms or it can uh, happen in several different random ways also, right? And once such variation or such mistakes or mutation occurs, the end result can be devastating for the uh, organism or the cell in particular. For example, here, one single nucleotide change results in an amino acid change that completely changes the shape of this red blood cell, which leads to uh, a very popularly characterized uh, condition called sickle cell anemia. So to understand how genomics is used, first we have to understand uh, the analysis approaches to DNA codes, specifically what we can identify, how we can identify these changes and how we can characterize them and how we can interpret their sign um, significance. Yeah, this we spoke, spoke about. So there are several mutations as we spoke about, right? So there are several changes to the DNA code uh, and what are these changes and how can they be characterized and categorized. We can refer to some of the mutations or changes as substitution mutation. A substitution mutation can cause several consequences to the DNA code, but it implies a minimal change that only leads to a single nucleotide change. Whenever a, a, a change in the nucleotide or change in the copied DNA, DNA sequence results in a change in one nucleotide level, change at one nucleotide level, that is termed as substitution mutation. And while an insertion mutation can be defined as an insertion of a new nucleotide to the copied DNA sequence compared to the uh, um, template DNA sequence. This insertion changes the number of DNA bases in the gene by adding one or more pieces of DNA. As a result, the protein made by the gene may not function properly because it now encodes completely new set of amino acid sequences. And uh, deletion mutation actually refers to removal of one or more 
a number of nucleotide base in the copied DNA sequence compared to the template DNA sequence. And this deletion actually changes number of DNA bases by removing a piece of DNA. Small deletions may remove one or large deletions may remove uh, an entire gene or several neighboring genes. This will definitely alter the function of the resulting protein as we discussed with the in insertion also. And uh, as the uh, deletion mutation may result in the uh, and uh, result in the complete change of the encoded protein sequence, which will now uh, change in the change at the structural level and also at the functional level. So, and uh, while there are also other variations that are possible, like gene duplication or duplication of regions that are abnormally copied one or more times, the type of mutation, um, yeah, this type of mutation may also alter the function of the resulting protein. Every type of mutation that we are actually dealing with has to end up or um, uh, are interesting only when it ends up at the level of uh, at the level of functional implications to the protein that it encodes. And point mutations are nothing but when all these variances or changes occurs at one nucleotide level. When the sub substitution is always point mutation, and when the insertion occurs at one single mutation level, a single nucleotide level, and deletion occurs at single nucleotide level. And those are all termed as point mutations as the change occurs in single point of the genomic position. So there are two basic uh, terminologies that we need to be very clear about. We term some, some of the changes as genetic variation and certain other changes as genetic mutation, a specific type of variation that leads to harmful results, for example, a change in function that is harmful, are termed as mutation. For example, if you see this graphic, we have the wild type uh, icon or Pikachu here, and while uh, there could be several variation for the genomes that mm, compared to the wild type uh, variant of this Pikachu, and these variation will produce noticeable change in the phenotype or morphology of the organism like blue eyes or here but like uh, a lack of the fur or lack of pigmentation but these and also addition of new features but these are not supposedly dangerous or supposedly harmful to the organism itself when the variation that we are studying are not uh, generally harmful to the organism themselves then they are these changes are termed as genetic variation. But while when this variation results in harmful changes or results in loss of function or complete alteration of function that leads to um, abnormalities in the organism themselves, then they are termed as pathogenic mutation. So we refer to mutations uh, uh, and they are always annotated or they are always associated with harmful end result and variation, they are always uh, associated with unknown consequences or consequences that are generally accepted to be less harmful or no uh, um, known harmful effects identified for those gen genetic variations or genomic variants. So when these genomic variants are often discussed, uh, we use both mutation and variant and also sometimes polymorphism is also used uh, several times. By convention, human genetic research, any genomic variant with the population frequency of less than one percentage is called as mutation. And whereas uh, the variant with the population frequency of more than one percentage is called as polymorphism. For example, something around, yeah, um, if I am studying a sample of more than one percentage of the population of the people or ethnicity that I want to study about, and if and all the variants that I am observing in more than one percentage of those uh, of those uh, sample sizes right of those population sizes uh, i have to name them or i have to term them as polymorphism and less than one percentage of uh, of variance at the population level not at the sample level at the population level should be termed only as variance or mutation depending upon their uh, um, uh, depending upon their mm, pathogenicity right let's name it that way, right this distinction actually is such based on population frequency rather than the sample frequency as we actually discussed right however 
as a rule, a rare mutation tend to have functional impact that deviates from wild type, while um, in contrast, polymorphisms generally uh, connote to less functionally deviant genomic variants, right? Uh, generally, when we refer to something as uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, we refer to uh, only those changes or mainly to those changes that are less harmful or that are known to harbor the changes at the phenotypic level that are not harmful to the races. For example, to uh, discuss an example, the very well known uh, blue eyes of Caucasians in Europe and also some, uh, some of them in, uh, in America is a result of single nuclear set of single nucleotide polymorphisms in the gene that corresponds to pigmentation in our um, eye level, right? At the eyes, for the eyes. And while uh, mutations, uh, however rare they could be, uh, they can result in some serious, uh, 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 some serious effects. A good example of such uh, mutation that causes serious changes at the phenotypical level is, uh, is at the FGFS gene that causes extremely long hair to be uh, to grow at eyebrows and eyelashes to to a certain level that it um, uh, that it uh, that it affects the um, affects the quality of life of the person or people involved. So we we spoke about different types of variants and mutations at the level of nucleotide, right? Now we can actually characterize the same mu um, variants and sorry uh, variants and mutations at the level of um, amino acid, uh, 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 amino acid uh, uh, um, residue that the uh, trinucleotide codon actually encodes. For example, we can have a missense mutation, which, uh, which refers to change in one DNA base pair that results in substitution of one amino acid for another in the protein made by this specific gene. For example, in this case, uh, one change in the nucleotide at the nucleotide level changes this one specific uh, amino acid from tryptophan to cysteine. This is a missense mutation. And some are actually termed as nonsense mutation where change in one uh, nucleotide level prematurely stops the building up of protein. And this results in a shortened protein that may not function properly at all. Right? There is also other kind of uh, changes like frame shift mutation where insertion or deletion of DNA bases changes the entire reading frame of the codon themselves. So resulting in a protein that is completely different from what it is supposed to be produced at the wild type level. And most often these proteins are usually non-functional. So to summarize, we can, uh, <coughs> uh, we can summarize this as genomic variation can be of several different types. When analyzing genomic data, uh, we are looking to find and characterize the changes in the DNA code and associate them with the phenotype of the organism. So some of the acronyms that we actually discussed and we should actually remember are SNPs and SNVs, right? And uh, to reiterate, SNV or single nucleotide variant, a single nucleotide change that may or may not be present in the whole of the population. Basically, this means any change from the reference genome found in the given DNA sequence above the level of technical error, right? All the changes that we find in our sample data that differs from the reference sequence are termed or are categorized as single nucleotide variants. And single nucleotide polymorphism is when a nucleotide that is known to be altered in a proportion of population. Typically, the proportion considered um, is approximately at the one percentage level of the population. And there are also other, uh, other terminologies like copy number variation when a gene is encoded multiple copies, encoded in multiple copies, and the number of copies varies between the reference genome and in the sample that we are analyzing. So these changes, as well as the characteristics of these variants that we are actually analyzing and identifying are commonly referred to as the genotype of that specific organism. So before moving on further, if you have any queries, please uh, share it with me. Okay, there is a general query about, uh, like to do about projects, about projects we will uh, actually get to know at the end of the session. And uh, yeah, and about the genomic databases, we actually uh, discussed. So let's move ahead and see 
how is genomics or how uh, supposedly are these variants and understanding of these variants are used in real life to help us understand the impact of this genomic data let's take a look at um, some of the genetically inherited conditions and diseases such as cancer mutations in oncogenes oncogenes and sometimes like infectious diseases and uh, um, for which drug resistance is involved and sometimes like uh, genetic genetically inherited conditions like sickle cell anemia and other cases right so most of the data that we are discussing here or information that we're discussing here and several other uh, um, examples of how genomics data analysis are helping us understand these uh, several implications are actually uh, available in the omics logic platform into several example projects these projects will actually uh, address at uh, uh, address at uh, enzyme function level for example at the drug metabolism or understanding somatic mutations uh, for tumor development or understanding genetically inherited mutations in the case of sickle cell anemia and other genetically inherited diseases or sometimes understanding the rare uh, single nucleotide variants that are involved in changes in the uh, structure and function level of some critically involved protein and also uh, some of the variants that are uh, known to uh, um, known to uh, develop drug resistance in the pathogen at the pathogen level not at the host uh, not at the host infection level some of the known pathogens like mycobacterium tuberculosis and even sometimes some sars variants are known to develop drug resistance to very well known antibiotics and anti um, uh, yeah antiviral uh, drugs that we are actually using so far so these are all some of the project examples that we will be dealing with the, uh, progression progression of the program and you will learn a lot about how the data or what kind of what type of data is analyzed and what is the analysis process and uh, how are we actually uh, um, using curated set of uh, curated data sets to uh, understand this level of genetic variance and its association with the disease type so for example to give you an example upon uh, a patient may be requested to uh, uh, go for um, dna sequencing uh, for, for uh, to help with the prognosis and diagnosis of the disease. So up, upon receiving this sequencing results for any sick patient, the first question uh, we usually ask, or the first question is that is usually uh, addressed is, what are the genes that are affected? So this is not a very simple question to ask while genomics is already used for, uh, currently being used for extensively used in diagnostics uh, and uh, diagno diagnostics levels in clinical care many of these dna variants are still being discovered and still being annotated and rigorously analyzed by uh, by the researchers and by uh, different uh, scientific groups and entrepreneurs all over the world so for example in the association of cancer the dna variation can help determine the genetic risk associated with oncogenes right but most often oncologists look for somatic mutation in uh, tumor suppressor genes or in onco genes or dna repair genes which are all very well known to be associated with the tumor progression so since cancer often more uh, since cancer most often occurs with age many researchers see or often notice this accumulation of somatic mutation in key genomic regions as a combination of driver mutation which can be associated to the progression of tumor and uh, passenger mutation which can be associated with the uh, to the result of this tumor progression uh, in the geno at the genomic level right this can actually help uh, help us diagnose the cancer early on it can actually help us evaluate the risk of the cancer severity it can actually uh, help us uh, look for appropriate treatment to slow down this um, cancer progression and help us uh, deal with this incurable metastatic cancer. So one particular gene uh, of interest is the tumor protein P53 or TP53. This encodes for a protein that is responsible for tumor suppression. Generally, it is present in all the cells. It is implicated in many cancer and it helps prevent tumor growth through the process called apoptosis. Some or several mutation in these genes can lead to loss of function and ultimately promoting tumorigenesis 
by not controlling the replication of the cells that uh, harbors abnormal growth with damaged DNA. So this is one of the very well known gene that is associated with the tumor progression and that we will also discuss in, uh, in a short while. Other diseases like cystic fibrosis can also be linked to individual genes like CFTR gene, which can affect the function of the channel that is responsible for clearing mucus from ARPS. Uh, this, is, this is an example of uh, uh, diseases that is caused at the uh, cost by genetically inherited mutation, right? These mutations are inherited uh, genetically and, uh, and um, uh, identifying such variants and such mutations can actually help in dealing with uh, some really deadly diseases like cystic fibrosis in this level. For example, um, uh, people or person that is harboring this specific variant or mutation to CFTRG can be uh, suggested to some uh, um, suggested to um, uh, treatment options that targets this specific channel to open up for clearing the mucus level at the at the uh, for the patients who are suffering from cystic fibrosis. So, and in generally uh, also some more uh, significant DNA variation. Uh, uh, where uh, the variation is now focused on not on uh, not at the single nucleotide variant level or collection of mutation level, it is now focused on abnormal number of copies that is present in one specific uh, present for one specific gene in specific chromosome uh, four. So in this case, it, uh, we are actually dealing with Huntington disease. Uh, where the HTT gene, which is associated with the Huntington's disease, encodes a large num large uh, protein, uh, Huntington protein, and um, um, uh, and uh, uh, the aberration that is caused is the uh, multiple insertion and deletions of uh, multiple insertion and deletions at the at this specific uh, nucleotide level, which results in abnormally long uh, Huntington protein. And hence, uh, the Huntington disease actually um, results in this. Right? Several of this information is actually available to us uh, due to the efforts of uh, researchers and the private uh, and the publicly funded uh, consortium, which publishes studies on several individuals with these diseases. And, and in this specific case, the Huntington's consortium actually published a study of over 1,000 individuals with early and late onset of this disease. And um, by uh, by actually applying targeted sequencing and as well as whole genome sequencing, uh, and this treasure trove of data is actually used by multiple uh, uh, used at multiple levels to understand the disease and in generally understand the level of DNA aberration and their involvement in um, the pathogenic effects of this DNA variation. Right. So as I mentioned, these changes. Changes in the DNA uh, or changes in the genomics level and their characterization should not stop at the human level, um, where we are de mostly dealing with um, responses to these uh, response. Sometimes we could be dealing with responses to externally uh, activated stress factors like uh, infection in that uh, or um, causes due to uh, external factors like uh, uh, stimulus due to pollution and other. Uh, criteria or abnormal indigestion and several other uh, situations. So in this specific case for infectious diseases, uh, we, we can actually use the same approach of studying variants, but not in the organism, not at the uh, human level where uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, actually causes severe diseases. Right? We can study the genomic sequence of the pathogen and understand uh, what these variations in the pathogens genome uh, actually refers to in uh, in uh, in terms of uh, uh, understanding the characteristics of the pathogen for increased virulence or increased resistance to specific drugs. Right. So to give you some sort of um, a, a relation and understanding, right? In in twentieth century alone, uh, tuberculosis was the leading cause of death in the United States only, right? And, and today, 
most of the cases are cured with specific or special regimen of antibiotic treatment that can stretch over several months. However, recently we have come to know that this bacteria has become more and more resistant to uh, several or single type of antibiotics. So it turns out that the resistance or this resistance is a result of one or multiple mutations in specific genes or uh, sometimes in the promoter that are uh, preceding these genes. Right? Understanding which gene and which, at, at, uh, at what position these variants um, actually are characterized and categorized to uh, different drug resistance level will actually help us uh, design uh, very efficient ways and efficient antibiotics and develop new drugs to address the surge of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis infections. And there is also uh, uh, another level of this drug resistance, which is called as extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, which simply is drug resistant to any type of antibiotic and any type of uh, preventive measures. So such resistance levels uh, of pathogen, the resistant pathogens are actually arising from the changes or random changes in the, uh, at the DNA level or at the genomic level, which suddenly could be beneficial to the pathogen. And very well known case of this is in the viral genome. And here we have an example of Ebola virus where, where um, changes at the one, uh, changes at one specific protein or one specific glycoprotein increase their transmission and back, uh, transmission and uh, uh, virulence of this Ebola virus. But we are, we are actually uh, witnessing the same level of uh, changes and uh, 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 <coughs> variants and variants of concern, variants of interest in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic that we are that we are currently facing right now. So all of these changes at the uh, genomic level um, can actually um, result in the changed characteristics of transmission or virulence for this viral, uh, um, for these virus in specific, uh, virus specifically, and only uh, some of them could be beneficial to the virus, but most of them could be detrimental to the virus. Since virus actually replicates at an accelerated rate, so we have a larger population of these um, of these uh, virus, which uh, eventually ends up uh, uh, ends up with the increased transmission rate or increased uh, virulence rate, and hence hence the birth of new and novel and uh, strains and variants of concerns and variants of interest, as we have been witnessing in the last two years so far. Right. So before going to how to practically get this information from the uh, sequence of genome or sequence of DNA in the genome. So if you have any questions, please again, put them in the chat box, we will go through. And while we actually understood or while we actually discussed that the technology which will allow us to generate digital information from the biological sample is called next generation sequencing or high throughput sequencing or NGS, this technology, as we know, was first developed during the Human Genome Project and has evolved tremendously since then, right? So many different sequencing techniques were introduced over the years. I'm not going to go over them. Let's quickly go over them. So in short, we have short read sequences and long read sequences, and each of them, short read and long read sequences have their own place in understanding the uh, gen genomic variants at the uh, DNA sequence level. So these different sequencing techniques, actually, why, are, why is it coming twice? I don't know. Okay, so um, actually will allow researchers like us to explore genetic variations like never before down to a single nucleotide resolution. And these different uh, techniques will actually help us explore the genomic variants at different resolution as we mentioned. So this could be at, uh, for example, whole genome level where we have, uh, where is it? Uh, at whole genome level, um, where we have to sequence all of the uh, DNA uh, bases. And uh, since the uh, amount of uh, information that is generated is huge, and that involves a lot of uh, resources in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of sample preparation, in terms of library preparation, and hence this is done at an average coverage of 30x, which defines the number of times one specific DNA base is being read. So this is an average coverage of 30x, um, average of 30x to be um, 
sufficient enough to build a map of whole genome of the sample that we are interested in and get, get it compared to the reference genome to understand sequence variation at the whole genome level. We can actually not focus on all the genome, right? If we are interested only on the uh, transcriptome or gene coding or protein coding part of the genome, we can cut down considerably on the amount of uh, DNA sequences that are uh, DNA bases that are sequenced and hence those uh, and hence the resources that are used to uh, used to uh, prepare libraries and sequence the, G, uh, sequence the DNA bases at the whole genome sequences can be um, used to focus only on the whole exome sequencing or uh, only the protein coding regions of the genome and uh, uh, such, a, uh, such a level of uh, sequencing can be performed or usually is performed at a 100x coverage level because our aim is to identify some of the rare variants that are present in the protein coding regions of the genome and which will help us associate this uh, variants and mutations to uh, disease type. And we can also actually focus on targeted sequencing, which will target specific regions of the gene. And, and that will, uh, again, uh, reduce the number of or amount of resources that we need to understand the genomic sequences. But there, we have to have some sort of prior physiological or biological understanding about the, about the regions that we are going to target. So how is this actually done to give you a preview or to give you a short introduction, right? The NGS technology captures the DNA sequences and generates the digital data using several steps. First, the RNA or the genomic DNA in this case is extracted from the cells and is then sheared and is placed in the flow cell. And inside the flow cell, these fragments of sheared DNA are amplified using PCR amplification or bridge PCR amplification method. Then this amplified cDNA copies or fragments are then inserted into the sequencer and the machine uses a form of image analysis to capture each and every letter in the flow cell fragments by analyzing visual patterns and converting them into the sequence of letters. So typically, uh, next generation sequencing reads are between 30 base pairs to 300 base pairs and they contain a series of these DNA bases that are A, T, G and C. And this is such raw data, raw sequencing data, to analyze such raw data, many different tools of genomic data analysis are used and they include alignment of reads and um, these include alignment, alignment of reads uh, and, and uh, analysis of relationships between the sequences and their evolutionary divergence and the measurements of gene expressions and relationships between sequences and structures and identification of somatic and germline variants and there are, these are different methods with which we can analyze this, uh, this raw data. And the TBioInfo server is an example of a platform or a big data platform that can be used expertly to perform all types of these analysis and many others using an intuitive user-friendly interfaces. Some of this we are going to have a look right now. So when, when this genomics data analysis is performed, it is usually performed with the FASTQ files which are the output of the next generation sequencer machines. Right? There are several important steps to be considered, such as pre-processing, mapping, variant calling, annotation of variances, and post-processing of these variances to understand their impact um, by relating that to the phenotypical and biological state of the sample. For each task, you can connect the analysis jobs into a pipeline, and each one will have various inputs and outputs. Sometimes it is just enough to visualize the FASTQ file alignment to a reference genome to quickly get an understanding of major variants that are present in our data. But uh, for most of the time, we, will, we might want to extend this to identification of these variants by statistically viable methods so that we can uh, perform downstream analysis with a lot of confidence and uh, identify um, uh, very well annotated mutations um, like mutations that are associated with the disease state, like mutations that are associated with uh, some uh, altered phenotypical conditions of the biology that has already been studied, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, this is, for example, the downstream analysis uh, will actually find a list of mutations, a list of variants, and these can be represented and this can be uh, uh, displayed 
in a different multiple different ways visualize in a multiple different ways one can form at the basic level we can annotate this as uh, what type of mutation that they are causing at the protein level or we can annotate this to what type of diseases that these variants are associated with so they can be tabulated results can give you a lot of information regarding these individual variants or we can visualize these variants at the plot like this which is called as lollipop plot where the length of the plot will uh, directly uh, refer to the um, number of variants that are present in our uh, data and we can also visualize their impact at the amino acid level by mapping their variants or variation onto the three dimensional structure of the protein that at that this g actually encoded to and identify whether the variation that is observed at the three dimensional structure of the protein is concentrated at the functional part of the protein or whether it is concentrated at the structural part of it so this and several other related data can be related information and uh, steps to perform this analysis can be found in the genomic scores which we will uh, refer to and use extensively in the program and um, along with the several other publicly uh, several other um, uh, example project which uses publicly available data to uh, perform specific uh, analysis types for different data to arrive at a, a, a a special biologically implicated conclusion that we will discuss. So if you have no questions until now, I want to quickly reshare my screen to, uh, um, to show you how these analysis can be performed and what we will be able to learn from these analysis methods. And let me find where is mine. Uh, is this, I think this is, so please confirm you can see my screen and I have now opened uh, course three, the genomics course in the omics logic website. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is the server, TBIO info server, and those who have uh, access to this server can actually follow along with me. Or if you want, if you prefer to watch uh, what I'm trying to do and trying to uh, give, uh, get a sense of what can be done, you are free to do so. So, so in the server TBIO info platform under the genomic section, we are right now uh, discussing extensively about this mutation variant or analysis of mutation variant data. So if you drop down this option and there are several demo projects that are available, which will give you the sense of building up of this pipeline with uh, all the necessary steps involved or most of the necessary steps involved. And uh, it will help you analyze the output file so that you can say, get a sense of what is being done and what we will get at the end of this analysis method. So let's take one specific demo pipeline where um, uh, we are trying to uh, understand variants that are specific to the TP53 gene. And this data is a targeted sequencing data. And you will know what do you mean, what I mean by targeted sequencing data in a while. So anybody who has uh, um, uh, uh, credentials to access Taubot Bioinfo platform or are actually will be um, will actually get access to this demo pipeline irrespective of the subscription level that they are at so uh, you are free to explore this so let's start so while you are starting we have actually uploaded the all the necessary input files to you so let's uh, perform the analysis observe that the next step or next possible steps are actually highlighted in this specific pipeline we are actually using only these steps but while in truth, when you are going to build the pipeline, at each and every step, the pipeline is going to give you all possible route that you can take and you have to choose depending upon the type of analysis that you want to do and the type of question that you are asking. In this specific uh, uh, pipeline, I'm just happy visualizing the variant that I have. Uh, oh no, sorry, for now. Uh, I'm, uh, in addition to visualizing the mapping of FASTQ files or of the reads onto the reference genome. I also want to identify the variants that are present in my data. So I include a variant calling algorithm or pipeline into this uh, um, uh, step into this pipeline. And I'm ending the date, ending the uh, analysis pipeline right now. Upon pressing N, you get access to all the output files. You are free to download this long or large VCF file and check what this VCF file generally will look like, right? While the mapping stats table, 
will tell you how good your uh, mapping of the samples that you sequence to the reference tree. And all of this information are condensed into this genome visualization option. which you can visualize uh, intuitively. So when you open this, this actually loads up the mapping table or mapping stats table. And the first key statistics that you want to uh, uh, confer to or you want to focus on is the overall alignment rate. When you see an overall alignment rate of over 90%, you are generally happy with the status or with the quality of your sample. So I see that it, the alignment is excellent for my sample. So I no, no longer need this information. I am going to uh, close this over to available real estate, right? Okay, so I have several of the tracks that is available in this visualization platform. What do I want to visualize? I first want to see the frame of reference, that is reference sequence, and so I enable that. And I also want to see the annotation of this reference sequence or all the genes that, are, uh, that can be named in this reference sequence. So I'm going to uh, enable the GTF or GFF file that is associated with the reference. And that is given here. And these are all the reads that I have. You can actually enable them to uh, visualize their alignment here. And but first, I want to see the result of my variant calling pipeline by enabling the VCF file out. And I want to see for one of the sample due to time and due to memory uh, constraints, I will just enable only one sample here so that I can visualize their alignment. When all of this is done, and for this specific data, you will not visualize anything because the nature of the data, as I mentioned, the data, the sample we have taken is targeted sequencing effort, and that targets only TP53 gene. So when we type TP53, we can go to TP53. Once you are in TP53, it's going to load up all the results and all the analysis that we have done so far. So it says zoom into C sequences, and these are all the reads that are mapped onto this specific portion of the sequences. And this is these are all the variants that we have identified from our sample compared to the reference sequences here. And the GTF file is still loaded. And this is the organization of the TP53 gene. So let me uh, take this specific portion. Right, You can select like this. And that's going to zoom into this region. So I can make some rearrangement by not showing translation and uh, pull this up and I can see that this will correspond to the, the height of this peak will correspond to the alignment of this read onto this specific region. And I can see variants at several places. Let's see some here exactly this point, right? So if you click on this one specific variant, it tells that this is a single nucleotide variant at this level where the C is actually, uh, the, um, um, uh, converted or changed to T, and that corresponds to this specific variant where you can see that um, uh, if you can read what's inside that specific um, box, which says, and which corresponds to this red uh, line or red bar, uh, uh, and the red bars, the height of the bar signifies to the alignment score or uh, confidence of this alignment to this. Uh, at this specific position. And we have uh, variant characteristics at this specific or this particular position. The position is uh, like uh, uh, 7,675,326. And uh, we have a reference, um, uh, we have uh, an altered sequence here where the reference is altered to T at 99% of the positions you can see there. And, uh, and, um, and for, for understanding what is a reference, we can refer to the uh, point mutation or uh, uh, single nucleotide variant at the VCF uh, visualization where the reference sequence is a reference nucleotide basis cytosine. And now it is actually mutated or uh, <coughs> converted into thiamine. So additional information about this variant is actually found on the right side panel of this specific visualization. So this is just one example of how to visualize your variant and their alignment strength. This is again, just only one specific, for example, you can take this uh, picture details, please. one uh, specific track. If you enable all of the track, then you will be able to understand or you will be able to uh, relate to 
how many of my sample harbor this specific variant and whether that is uh, valid or not. For example, if you go a little bit on to the left or right, you will find not so strong bar, right? This has a very a tall bar, a not so strong bar. That means, for example, this specific variant, that means the reference sequence has 86 percentage of the reference nucleotide present in our sample and only remaining um, 13 or 14 percentage is actually distributed to several different other variants that we generally see here. So this is how you can visualize the, um, visualize your pipeline results. And I also wanted to show you uh, available resources to perform some analysis in R to clinically uh, annotate your results. I'm not going to go over them or I'm not going to demonstrate to them because of, of no, not much time. So it's available here. Um, so what you can do is you can take this VCF file, that is the output that that this pipeline gives you an output, right? This, this VCF file, you can take this and load in an environment like R, where you can read each and every one of these uh, variants and process them and store them separately. And you clinically available uh, variants that are characterized in the ClinVar database. And this database not only lists all the variants that are available for that specific gene or specific, I mean, in fact, for all of the genome, and uh, uh, it also annotates them as uh, at the clinical significance level, like um, uh, this being uh, benign or this variant being uh, um, uh, unannotated or this variant being uh, likely pathogenic or this variant being cl clinically pathogenic. So we can go through several steps of selecting only clinically pathogenic variants and comparing that with the variants that we have identified for our sample. And in this specific case, we can actually identify six, uh, uh, six uh, specific variant and one of them being that we discussed so far and where the C is changed to T, I think that is this is the, this is the same variant. And this variant is actually characterized as likely benign in the ClinVar database. And we have several other variants that are also characterized as benign. And uh, when you do this analysis for, for example, this is a curated data and hence the only variants or only significance that we could identify is likely benign or benign. And when you do this analysis to, uh, for, for all the uh, uncurated data set, then you are likely to find some pathogenic variants like we have four pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants and they can be, uh, uh, listed as uh, here. So um, this is completely, uh, uh, yeah, this, this, uh, this, this type of analysis is, uh, can be performed in, in, in an environment like R using all the codes that we have provided here. And in addition to providing this code, we also give you a section where you can try out these codes in the R console that is loaded in the backend itself. For example, here, just by reading what it's supposed to be doing, for example, um, by taking the link copying the link for the input file and pasting at the specific position uh, in the R function. And uh, this console, this challenge or this technical challenge here is given for you to test your understanding of the code that we have given in this specific section. So here you can type, uh, complete the uh, syntaxes. We have left out some of the portions of the syntaxes so that you can get a sense of understanding uh, how these analysis can be performed. So when you complete all the necessary incomplete syntaxes and you get uh, success in running the code and understanding the code in general. So this is just one small example. We have several other examples of these um, using these methods and we have specific assignment where you, we have given you a, a console to try this assignment uh, for a different uh, type of data or, or data that is slightly different to the type of data that we have uh, been discussing in this specific lesson so far. So that will, with that, that will conclude my uh, um, uh, lecture. So uh, all of this and, and uh, extensive uh, discussion and step-by-step -step, uh, processing a step-by-step -step analysis building types and everything is uh, discussed uh, uh, um, in a, in a live uh, or uh, asynchronous um, uh, 
course type in the genomics program. And I, I hope to see many of you in the program and we will discuss this and also several other impactful publications and uh, example projects with which we can understand how to perform this analysis on genomics data to understand the variants and their relationship to uh, disease, to, to different pathological state of the um, pathogens and uh, generally understand the biology of the sample that we are dealing. So I now uh, can take some of the questions if you have any and hand over the podium back to uh, Sri Gauri if she has something to say. Thank you so, so please much. Let so us know, sorry, uh, please let us know if you have any questions in the chat box and yeah, we will uh, discuss them. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Meanwhile, the participants are sharing their queries. Now I'd like to pass on the stage to Ms. Parshtar to discuss about the fee structure and the associated resources that you get as a part of the program. So over to you, Sparsh. Uh, thank you so much, Sri Gauri. So let me share my screen. Sri Gauri, could you please confirm that I'm audible and uh, if my screen is visible to all? Uh, yes, uh, the audio is a little bit uh, faded, but otherwise the now screen is it Yes, it's all. Now the audio is fine, Shrivari? Yes, it is. Thank you. Oh, perfect, perfect. Um, so, uh, good evening, good afternoon, or uh, good morning from whichever part of from uh, you all participants are. So I am Sparsh Dhar and uh, I'm the marketing manager here at Pine Biotech. So I'll uh, quickly guide you through the fee structure of the genomic data analysis mentor guided program and also the resources uh, which you will have access to if you enroll in this program. So this is the program page and uh, here's the link to the program page in the chat box. Uh, you can go through uh, after the webinar ends. So the program is commencing on 19 September next week from Monday onward. So those who are interested to be a part of this program, they can uh, enroll themselves in this coming week. So when you scroll down, you will see the program overview, what exactly we will be covering, the program, uh, why this program is designed, for whom it is designed and uh, what all applications or role in genomic data analysis you will be studying uh, to discover the genomic variation or apply genomics in translational sciences, et cetera. So when you will move further, you will see an interactive session calendar where there are few dates highlighted. So on every Monday and every Friday, there will be a session uh, that will be conducted for this particular program. And it can be either asynchronous session or it can be uh, either live sessions. It will be uh, like we will be, we will um, send you an, a calendar invitation accordingly. So as you can see here on the right hand side, uh, there are different sessions which we'll be conducting on genomics. So the first session uh, that is on 19th of uh, September, it is on genomic data analysis where we'll be covering the overview of the course, where uh, there are different topics related to next generation sequencing data, omics data, molecular determinants of phenotype, then we'll be covering about applications of bioinformatics, introducing you about the introduction to bioinformatics course books, which we have different terminologies, it's healthcare applications, uh, pharma, R&D and agriculture, et cetera. Then moving on to the second, uh, we will be unraveling genomics and working with DNA sequences using R. Then the third is regarding the NGS, next generation sequencing, its overview, history and application. So as you will see, and you'll scroll further, you will see the title of the sessions, the topics which we'll be covering, and also the online associated resources, which we'll provide you once you will enroll for the program. So now moving further, uh, scroll, if you'll scroll down, you will see three different tenures for which you can enroll in this or register for this particular program. One is 45 days, another is 60 days, and then is 90 days. So what is the difference between the three tenures? In 45 days tenure, 
you will be going through with an extensive mentor guided training related to genomics data analysis and the resources which we include the common resources which we include in all these three tenure are online tutorials project examples coding sessions session recordings online mentor support via our skype group or telegram groups online technical support and certificate of completion and example cloud pipelines on tbio info server so in 45 days tenure as i said earlier you will be going through with an extensive mentor guided training program in 60 days other than uh, other than the extensive training you have two opportunities one is one on one mentor guidance like you can if you have any further query while going through the training part so you can fix a one on one meet with the mentor maybe of 15 to 20 minutes and get clarify your doubts secondly uh, you have an opportunity to draft a research proposal and present it to mentor for further evaluation and get expert feedback and now moving to the last tenure that is 90 days you will be having the opportunity to draft a research project you will be having an opportunity to draft a research project and uh, get it published in a good peer reviewed journal so these were the resources which you'll avail uh, in these tenures as mentioned and the difference between these tenures now uh, if you will see here on the right hand side top corner there is a drop down menu so those people uh, they can change according to their locations the currency of the program right now it is in usd if someone is in nigeria they can go it for naira if someone is brazil they can go it for brl for euros for in inr and so on so please accordingly accordingly change according to your locations so this was all about the resources the fee structure of the program and also yes we have scholarships so those who want scholarship to get themselves enrolled for a uh, for this particular program they can mail us at marketing at the rate omixlogic.com and uh, we'll help and we'll guide you accordingly so here's the mail id i'm pasting it in the chat box rest uh, if anyone is having any queries related to the registration part or the resources part uh, please mention it in the chat box and i'll be here to answer your queries thank you hello shri gauri all right thank you yes sparsh yeah 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 okay all right thank you so much sparsh So, if anyone has any queries, please put them in the chat box, and I hope to see you all at the genomic data analysis program. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes, Sparsh has also shared her contact number in the chat box. So, if you have any queries, please ah uh, share in the number provided as well. we do have a query of uh, will the program involve pack bio analysis and illumina yeah uh, hello stella most of the data analysis will actually uh, not uh, consider long read sequencing analysis or long read long reads um, uh, but the logic is actually same so we are focusing mainly on the short reads uh, and in, that are from the illumina and from any many other methods which will produce short read fast files so Uh, these methods and their uh, analysis are involved in long reads for uh, short reads only for the mapping and identification of the variants but once you have identified the variants and using variant calling uh, variant calling format vcf file the downstream methods can be applied to the vcf file that is generated from uh, basically any uh, method or any um, different uh, read right that part is actually universal 
but only the pipeline building of uh, taking the reads to map it onto the genome and identifying variants is specific to the short read technology. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, Ramdan says, thank you, sir. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience. If any more queries are left, please put that in the chat or you can share it in the number provided by Sparsh. Thank you so much. Have a great day.